I'm Lisa Senecal. And I'm Maya May. And tonight we're speaking with Terry Canefield and asking, is Trump going down? We are speaking starts now. Oh, so we've all been on Twitter. We've seen the think pieces and think tweets about Merrick Garland's efforts to prosecute Trump. And it's always been like a fountain of comments of like, Trump will never be held accountable. And people like, oh, we need to hold Trump accountable. Uh, but in order to have an opinion, you need to be informed. At least you should be informed. Okay. Unfortunately, part of the problem out there is there are a lot of think pieces that don't seem to require a whole lot of thinking. It's just a lot of uninformed hot takes. Um, which is why we're super excited about our guest tonight. Yes, she is a former appellate defender and political pundit. Her analyses have appeared in the Washington Post, on NBC, elsewhere. She's the author of a dozen books, writes extensively about the legal peril Trump may or may not face. Uh, and she also taught fiction writing, so we're going to talk about that. Please welcome to the show, Terry Canefield. Hello, Terry, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. Thanks for being um, here. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm sure you just heard us saying everybody's got an opinion on what Garland is or isn't doing at DOJ. Like right now, opinions are like belly buttons. Everybody's got one. Those opinions are mostly unburdened by facts or any experience. So we're so excited to have you here um, because you do base everything you write um, and speak about on facts and your experience. So what is your informed take? On what's happening right now? Yeah, with Garland and the DOJ and... Well, um, we can look at what happened most recently, which we just learned last night that Pat Cipollone, White House counsel um, under former President Trump, has been subpoenaed by a federal grand jury looking at this probe. And so you say, wait, what does that mean? Um, well, um, some basic criminal procedure, right? An indictment comes out of a grand jury. And so what a, what a prosecutor does is first they examine all of the evidence coming from investigators. They talk to people who they can talk to. There are a lot of people, there are a lot of stages before you get to a grand jury. And so a grand jury um, comes after quite a long process and particularly in something as complicated as the crime that we're looking at, which has so many different facets, right? right. Um, there's the fake elector part, and there's the pressure of the legislators, and there's pressure of people like Raffensperger, and then there's the military precision, which with some of these paramilitaries planned their attack on the Capitol. And there's just so many different um, parts of this that um, there would be a lot of legwork before you get to a grand jury. Now, why was the grand jury convened? We really don't know. We don't know who the targets are. Um, we don't know exactly why the grand jury was convened. We don't know much. And the reason we don't is because it's actually illegal for people to talk about grand jury proceedings. Um, witnesses can talk. And so um, we really don't know much other than what comes from witnesses. And um, what we know right now is that I think last week we found out that um, Mark Short, who was the... Um, he was the chief of staff, right, mm -hmm. for Pence, and uh, Greg Jacob, who is counsel to Mike Pence, they were in front of the grand jury last week. And now this week we have Pat Cipollone, um, who has been subpoenaed to appear before a grand jury. So a lot of process to get to this part point. And we can talk about how it is that Merrick Garland has been conducting the investigation, but we know it's a long way to get where we are. And where we are is you don't get much closer to the inner circle. Absolutely. And so let's say you are the former POTUS and you allegedly incited a violent insurrection, did nothing to stop it while people died. Would you be concerned if a federal grand jury looking into all that subpoenaed your White House counsel? Well, I'm not going to speak to the psychology of, of Trump <laughs> <laughs> because, but I can tell you most people at this stage would be very, very, very worried um, because you don't. Um, it's sort of a joke. You, you don't want to be the last one called in front of the grand jury. 
because that would probably meet near the target. So there, there's witnesses who really have no criminal liability and they're, they're no, they, they have some you know, knowledge of what happened. And then there's subjects who are under suspicion of some kind. And then at some point there's a target of, of the investigation, somebody who the prosecutors are really looking at. We don't know who's who, but we, we do know that, um, that Pat Cipollone has been called in front of the grand jury and that this is grand juries are convened for the purposes of bringing indictments. And so, and he is Trump's former um, White House counsel. So most people at this stage would be in a state of complete panic. Um, yeah. And they would be very, <laughs> very, very worried. Um, I say most people, um, in uh, most of my criminal defense work, I represented indigents. I represented people who couldn't afford to pay. But before I opened my practice dedicated 100% to indigents, I did some work in some private firms, um, gain, getting the experience right out of law school. So I did see some sort of white collar defendants and some wealthier defendants. And one of the things that I, that I noticed um, is some people just really don't realize they're in trouble. And I can remember the, um, you know, lawyers with a lot more experience and he sort of took control of the cases, actually lying, uh, yelling at clients once in a while and saying, you are in trouble. <laughs> like you are in trouble because it's they so don't insane. really get it. You're in I'm trouble. sorry. It's like, so yeah, they don't really get it. <laughs> Snap out of that. You're in trouble. Yeah. They, and they don't get it. And, and I do have one memory of a person who had, um, who was charged with six federal felonies, um, sort of uh, financial crimes. And I remember sitting across the table from him and he said, I knew I was pushing the envelope a bit, but I had no idea I was violating six federal statutes. And I think that was like the moment. And he, he had some really bad moments in our office um, that <laughs> afternoon. And, and he left very shaken. Um, and a few things happened while he was there. But whether Trump is actually worried at this point has a lot more to do with um, his psychology, which I'm not an expert in. Um, but I can tell you, if I was involved in an incident and there, the feds were investigating that incident as a crime and all my friends were being called to the grand jury, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I'd be worried. It's time to maybe panic. Yeah. I'd be worried. I'd be worried about it. And, um, like and there was some there. reporting yeah. last week that, that Trump's team is coming up with possible defenses. And what they said is this is an abundance of caution. It would be, it would be sort of malpractice not to consider what their defenses would be, given the fact that some pretty high up people in Trump's administration are talking to the grand jury. Well, you, you wrote a piece um, that, that did talk about one of those defenses, uh, which is the, the freedom of speech, First Amendment. Uh, and you said, uh, or you wrote in your piece, that there are indications that Garland is preparing for this, that that, that free speech argument might not hold water. Can you explain your thinking? Well, one thing about the free speech argument is it was sort of torpedoed by facts that have come out. So if you rewind back to what we knew at the time of the second impeachment, what we knew that we knew Trump sent out that tweet, I think uh, the 19th of December saying, be come to DC, it will be wild, be there. And then we know that um, at the ellipse that, that day, um, right before time perfectly for when Congress was going to certify the votes, um, he sent the crowd to the Capitol and said, it's going to be wild. You have to fight. You're going to lose your... And then there was a great big violent insurrection. And at the time, what people were asking, because those were the facts we had, which is one of the reasons why you don't bring indictments until you have all the facts. Because the facts we had then, what, the, what um, legal commentators were talking about and debating is, is fight like hell? Is that enough? Mm -hmm. Well... Elizabeth Warren says by like hell, you know, where do you, is that enough mm -hmm. to have, be, to be responsible for what happened? And it's tricky. It can be argued. And I think that, um, that if I had to argue it, I could put together an argument, but I could also defend against it pretty effectively. Not, not that it, just because you have a defense doesn't mean the defense succeeds. 
right. but I would have a defense. And so, um, so what's happened since then is we learned a few things. One is we learned that um, that the people who really did the violence and um, sort of came, figured out how to get into the Capitol, these paramilitaries, they didn't even go to the speech. They skipped the speech. They had it all planned out before the speech. Now you can see if your whole case rests on be there and go fight like hell, if your whole case rests on arguing that Trump incited the insurrection through those words, all of a sudden you're on shaky ground when the people who really committed the violence didn't even hear the speech. But if you can show that Trump is connected to that paramilitary training, then even though the First Amendment defense, you don't, it doesn't even matter anymore because now you've got far more evidence or far more culpability. But the First Amendment defense um, is sort of a little bit of a wash. Now, what, um, what they, Trump has tried to say is that everything he said prior to January 6th is protected speech. Well, um, some things are and some things aren't protected speech. You cannot walk up to a teller and say, give me all your money and then say, I had a first amendment right. <laughs> a lawyer could say that though, right? Because we were talking before the show about narrative because you do have a background as a, a fiction teacher in addition to being an appellate lawyer. So can you talk a little bit about this narrative because you're, you're, you're speaking to it now and I really want people to understand a little bit about what you said before because it was so fascinating about how they're being kind of like different narratives and whoever has right. the best one. Right. So as you learn more facts, our understanding of what happened changes. So once you know, for example, that these paramilitaries did their planning with, and they planned this attack with, with military precision and that this all happened even before Trump called everybody to Washington, D.C. Before, if, if it was in the works before December 19th, and if it, that changes the whole narrative, mm -hmm. it changes the story of what happened. And so it's, it's almost like a very bad example, but maybe with the theories of physics that you have gravity, you drop it and it falls. Well, gravity is one theory, but then Einstein comes up with a whole different theory that explains the same phenomenon with, with space curving or what have you. But you have a, a fact and then you have ways to explain it. And the, it can be, it, as you learn more facts, you can find out that the, what the narrative you had to start with really isn't what happened. You can also have two different narratives, both are true, um, but a different perspective. And that's not what we're talking about here. So right. that's something else. So is that my talk? So let's take a criminal trial. <laughs> the prosecutor has one way of yeah. presenting the truth. Right. The prosecutor says he did, you're, the defendant did this and this and this and this. And it's, the story looks really, really, really bad. Things mm -hmm. look the worst for the defendant after the prosecution rests its case. That's when things look the worst. Then the defense gets a chance. Okay. And then the defense also tells the truth, but a different version of the story. This is this is the rest of the story. This is the part you didn't hear. This is also true. And what the defense it's, a, it's competing versions of the same story. That's different from the story actually changes as we get more yeah. facts. Um, I mean, there's, I guess, some, some overlap. But the First Amendment defense, I think, is going to end up completely irrelevant to, to anything because you don't have a First Amendment. You have a First Amendment right to have a, to have a, a rally and to say, we need to fight like hell. That probably is somewhat covered. You have to show that that was intended to incite a riot and did incite a riot. You know, there's all kinds of things you have to show, but you absolutely do not have a, a First Amendment right to to uh, plan an insurrection. No. <laughs> you know, that's not it's not protected speech to say, OK, here's how we're going to do it. Right. You're going to do this and I'm going to do this. And this is going to all result in overturning the election. You can't say that's protected speech. That's like saying I have a I have a First Amendment right to plot your murder and then do it. Um. <laughs> yeah, the the other right that folks have is to have a defense 
Um, and as a former defense attorney, I'm sure you feel very strongly that everybody deserves representation. But there are some lines that attorneys are not supposed to cross. And it seems like we have uh, quite a list of folks who might have crossed those lines. Rudy Giuliani, Jenna Ellis, Sidney Powell, John Eastman. Uh, it's a long list. So where where do you think that line is? And do you think any of these folks are going to end up being prosecuted for their uh complicity in the crimes of their client. Right. So what they did wasn't in the, in the, um, in the role of a defense lawyer, they were not defending somebody who had been accused of a crime. So a defense lawyer does, does something else entirely, which is your client has been charged. And now that your client has been charged, you look at the evidence against your client and basically you try to poke holes in it. So that's what the defense lawyer does. And there are lines a defense lawyer can't cross. You, can't, you cannot lie to a court. Um, and you can't raise frivolous, you can't raise frivolous arguments. And so um, what these lawyers are doing is something else entirely, which is they're using their legal um, understanding, their, their legal expertise, well, Eastman, um, some of them have some legal expertise, some of them... <laughs> I'm not really sure. They, I'm not sure what what was really going on with their law degrees and their legal background, but uh, <laughs> but they but they're doing something else. They're participating in a crime, and um, and lawyers aren't allowed, you're not allowed to do that. <laughs> you know that you're um, and lawyers do actually do things they shouldn't do. Um, one of the shocks when I first passed the California bar and I got the California bar newspaper and you open it up and you see, oh my God, all of these disbarred lawyers wow. and all the things they did, like what? Open it up sometime. It's shocking. Um, and a lot of them are small things like, well, okay, they're no small things, but they're, <laughs> but they're not on the order of help the current president overturn the election. Right. Um, you know, they're, they're things that you could see somebody getting into trouble and doing a, a lawyer mingling client funds. He runs out of money to pay his bill, so he dips in and oops, and now he can't pay it back, and now he's in trouble. Um, you know, lawyers, um, I guess uh, most people would laugh at that, even if you say lawyers do bad things sometimes. <laughs> oh, <really>? um, <laughs> that sounds like a joke, right? Um, <laughs> like, do but, you? <laughs> but, but prosecuting lawyers, it, it takes a few extra legal steps. Right. So well, to get a lawyer's phone, for example, um, it takes it takes a little bit more. And, when, and the fact that these investigators now are going after lawyers and their phones, um, they have to, you know, they have to make sure that they don't violate certain. I mean, there are certain privileges, but you're but you can't hide a crime behind a privilege. Exactly. Well, it seems like it's time for the lawyers to start lawyering up um, as as they start to kind of go after all of the little guys, because we're seeing that like that's the seriousness of the crime. You know, we just uh, a federal judge sentenced Guy Ruffett. Uh, he was the capital rioter. He was convicted more than uh, in, in seven years. He was given seven years. So is, is that what you think is happening? Does, and does that kind of give us an indication of like the seriousness of this? Like how many years is Trump going to do? That's what I want. <laughs> we have so many steps to get to before you get there. Um, but yeah, the way that this investigation is being conducted is that what the DOJ is doing, and they're doing this for a few very good reasons, is they're starting with like what they call the most overt crimes. And these are the crimes that happen that are really super easy to prove because that's, that's where you start. And as a matter of um, how you operate in a rule of law country is you investigate crimes. You don't investigate people. Obviously, the people committed the crimes. So when you investigate the crime, you, you get to the people, but you don't target people at the start. That's the difference between persecution and justice, hmm. right? And, and if you think about what what Trump wanted Zelensky to do. He, did, he, wa he didn't care about a crime. He cared about it. He wanted to name a person being, being investigated. And so what the DOJ, what 
Trump, what uh, Merrick Garland has said is that he needs to do two things. He needs to hold everybody criminally responsible, everybody accountable who was criminally responsible for the events. But he needs to do it in a way that has integrity and, um, and is, uh, maintains rule of law. And so he needs to do it with integrity. And so one of the ways to do that is you, you target crimes and then the facts lead you to other facts. And, and it's, it's been sort of, sometimes you can see it as a ladder or you can see it as, as you're moving inward because the planners aren't out, the pl a lot of things happen behind closed doors. So the attack on the Capitol wasn't behind closed doors. But the actual planning, there was a, a meeting, I forgot the day it came, it came out in one of the hearings. There was a meeting, I think the, the evening of the third or the fourth, maybe it was the fifth, um, where it was at a hotel and Cassidy Hutchinson warned Mark Meadows not to go and he phoned it in instead of appearing. But this is, the some of the most egregious crimes happen in a room with nobody there but the people who committed the crime. Right. OK, so the, that's the hardest to get to, because if you do this, I'm an aggressive prosecutor, beat chest, I'm going to go right to the top and I'm going to haul them all in before the grand jury and make them all talk. We've got a problem because, first off, it, it's it's perjury to say I don't recall if you do recall. That's perjury, but it's very rarely prosecuted because some people don't recall. And you so you can always hide behind and. If you tried to prosecute that, you'd end up opening up a, a whole lot. It's, it's rarely prosecuted. There's always the Fifth Amendment. And so if a crime happened, the planning, whatever happened at that meeting, who is there? Roger Stone, who, who was in that meeting? But they're all, uh, they're not talking. They're not going to go march into the DOJ and hand over their phones, right? So if the, if the most serious of the crimes happen in a, in a room, with only six people or seven people. That's the hardest to get to. So you start with, and if you target that, you don't even know for sure when you start that there was a crime there right. because you don't really know when it all happened. Hmm. So if you target people to start with, then that really does look like persecution and you don't want to normalize what Barr did. Hmm. A lot of people are really critical of what Barr did um, with taking orders from Trump and going after Trump's enemies and leaving his friends alone. They were just horrified, and now they actually want Merrick Garland to do that. So Merrick Garland saying, "No, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to. We're going to. We're going to go for the overt crimes, the crimes that we can see. Start with those and start moving inward. And we've seen it move inward. A few people, several people who are cooperating now with the with the prosecution, were in the room. Right. Right. One was in the room with Roger Stone that morning. And so um, if you start with the, the crimes where, okay, I can get you. The, the prosecutors have a, a thing they do. Look, we got solid evidence on six crimes. Man, you're going down for 15 years. You better think about this. You cooperate and we'll knock off some of these big ones. So you go for the overt ones, the ones that are easy to grab. And then one of the things that's remarkable is how many guilty pleas they've gotten and how much cooperation they've gotten. We don't know yet what is what evidence has been turned over because it's all, the prosecution is happening behind closed doors. But the idea is to work inward so that by the time you get to that room, who was in the room when it happened, right? To Hamilton. Yeah, I know. It's like we need a soundtrack, right? So, <laughs> so by the time you get there, now I would say that Eastman is under some pressure to cooperate hmm. because I'm not sure Eastman has, okay, Eastman's criminal liability is a whole lot less than some other people. So there's, there's levels. Of criminal right. liability. Right. Right. To this. And, right. I, and, and yet so many people are, you know, saying, you know, the GOP is like, oh, we're going to impeach Garland if we take the House. Um, do you think he even cares? Because from what you're telling me, it sounds like he's doing the pretty good yeah, He's doing his thing. He's doing his thing. Um, no, he doesn't care. And it's silly because impeaching Gar Garland has about as much effect as the Democrats when they try to impeach 
Trump, removal still requires two thirds of the Senate. Right. Okay. So <laughs> they're not going to remove him. And even, it's just not, it's, it's silly. It's not going to happen. Yep. And so, um, so some people worry because the Senate was firmly in the hands of the, of the Republicans um, during when Trump was president, people worried even that an impeachment, what, what's that going to do? Well, what it could do is get the truth in front of people. Right. But what, right. what, what's what truth? truth? Yeah. Right. So it, it's all silly. It's all, it's all, um, it shows you exactly kind of who you're dealing with, but now I'm sure he's, that's the right. last thing he's worried about. I don't think he's worried about other people yelling him at, on Twitter either. Right. Truth. More, more <laughs> political theater than That's it is true. substance. <laughs> so Maya and I follow the, the work of the January 6th committee as closely, um, you know, as, as it is to do. And that, but still watching these hearings, there have been times when, when I've like had to pick my jaw back up off the floor. Are there, can you tell us what a couple of revelations are that you've learned during the hearings that, that were really surprising to you and also might, I, I know the committee has a different role than the DOJ, obviously, but that could advance the work of the DOJ. I was fascinated. Well, first off, a few of the facts I already mentioned that changed our understanding of what happened, because I was one of the people who was discussing the, whether or not Trump had a First Amendment defense to fight like hell. I was into that discussion. Does he have a First Amendment defense? And then you find out, wow, we just got some facts that say that's sort of irrelevant because, um, because now we, wait, the, the, you can't even connect it. So that whole argument is irrelevant. So if you, so that struck me as well. We've spent an awful lot of time, you know, <laughs> making these legal arguments on one side and the other, when it turns out that once we had all the facts, it wasn't as, as important. Right. But what fascinated me about the, um, about the J6 hearings was this process that you go to to get to the truth. Hmm. It doesn't come, all, come out all at once. And it, a, a sort of naive thing is, well, subpoena them all, make them all talk and throw them in jail if they don't. Okay, well, you're not going to get the truth that way. For reasons I told you, people are, people are going to hedge, they're going to forget, they're going to stand on the fifth, they're going to all kinds of things. But what was really interesting was, um, say, Cassidy Hutchinson, fascinating. So when she first, um, she was a Trump supporter. She was part of the administration. She was a diehard supporter. And when she first was called by the committee, she needed a lawyer. She contacted the only people she knew could help her, which are the rich men she worked for. And um, she did get a lawyer from a Trump super PAC who, um, under the legal advice she was getting and whatever, wherever, whatever space she was in, which was still, she was a Trump supporter. So she's still in whatever space that was. When she first went to the committee, reading between the lines or not so between the lines, she wasn't all that forthcoming. Hmm. So they didn't learn much from her. She was probably following the advice of a Trump, um, a Trump supporting attorney who taught her how to avoid talking. Hmm. And you could do that. You can avoid talking. She went through some process. And another hint we have, she bonded with Liz Cheney. And so some, and that makes a lot of sense. One of the headlines said unlikely bonding. How is that unlikely? This is a young Republican woman. She's an older Republican woman. And they both had to extract themselves from this MAGA mindset. So it makes perfect sense to me. So she bonds with Liz Cheney. She gets a new lawyer. She does some process, something in her head and, and with her friends and with her family and whatever she had to do to go through some, some real soul searching. Next thing you know, now she's telling, now she's forthcoming. Now she says, I'm going to talk and she's going to tell the truth. And so what that, one of the, spe the speech that Merrick Garland gave, I think it was on January 5th this year, the, the one year anniversary. He said, there's not an account, you don't have an accounting all at once. Mm -hmm. With, with something this complicated. It doesn't happen all at once. It, it unfolds, it reveals itself. And the, the Cassidy Hutchinson story is, is one. Another is the Eastman story, because what's happening to Eastman 
is right now Eastman is under some serious pressure. Now, Eastman's smart enough to know he's in trouble. He doesn't mm -hmm. need a defense lawyer to yell at him and tell him you're in trouble. He knows he's in trouble because <laughs> the feds took his phone. Right. They don't That's do that for flimsies, right? Yeah. Anytime someone gets their phone taken, like if I take my kid's phone. <laughs> so <laughs> if the FBI grabs your phone with a search warrant, you're in trouble. Okay. So <laughs> so he knows he's in trouble. Now the, the other reporting we have confirmed from Liz Cheney and other reporting is that one of the defenses that Trump team is playing with is to throw some of his advisors under the bus. Mm -hmm. He relied on bad advice. Now, how do you think Eastman feels about that? Right. So, so let's say that Trump decides it was all Eastman's idea. He was misleading me. Now, meanwhile, Eastman's looking at some criminal liability and they got his phone. So Eastman needs to make some decisions. Now, what's he going to do? I don't know. Um, I don't know what Eastman would do. But I know if I had a client who was in any way connected, who had no criminal liability, we would be in there so fast. I, but if you have, right, if you have a limited criminal liability and you're about to get thrown under the bus, it's, there's a, that's how these narratives are, or these stories are, or this way that the truth is unfolding is happening as we're watching, but it's a process. So I think that's one of the most interesting things for me. I absolutely love that take. It's like the slow drip to justice, um, like a coffee, like the slow drip. Um, with all the legal work that you've done, um, and we're almost out of time, so this is our last question, but we talked about it earlier, um, poll working, you... Uh, you did a little bit of poll working, but as a, a legal, um, as a legal advisor, um, making sure that everything was kosher there. But um, can you just talk about poll working in general and why you think um, it's an important experience to have, and might, maybe what you would say to potential volunteers? Well, um, my my legal work around elections was with um, legal support for um, voters who had trouble voting or issues um, with uh, you know sort of. A, on a, on a larger scale, yeah. you know, what's happening in the state, yeah. what kind of litigation can be brought. Um, but we need good poll workers and um, and poll workers are under attack right now. Actually, one of the things that the Republicans have done well for decades is they understand politics is local and they have gone for local, local election boards, local. Now they're going for school boards. But democracy, it means rule by the people. And that's us. And so that means that we need to step up and there are different states have different things people can do. You can become a you, you can become the person who counts the votes. How cool is that? Sure. And now that these now that there is death threats against some of these people, it's heroic work. But we need more people doing this ground level work. A good poll worker makes it easier for somebody to vote. A bad poll worker makes it a little harder. And, and there are differences in the quality of a poll worker. Oh, no, that's too hard. No, you got to come back later. Right. Yeah. Or wait, let's figure that out. Right. So it's a very, very important thing for people to consider doing it at all. You can move up. You can become in charge of a polling place after you volunteer a few times. It's fun. I it's fun. We yeah. appreciate that so much. We we spend a lot of time uh, on the show and overall at the Lincoln Project encouraging people to get involved. There are real grassroots things. So um, your words ring so very true and are really important to hear um, on poll working, but on everything we've talked about tonight. So thank you so much, Terry, for being with us. Um, we are definitely going to have to have you back. Yes. Oh, thank you. It was really a lot of fun. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> I, I love it. Um, I want people to step up and become poll workers. Um, and actually, uh, I just found out that uh, the U.S. Election Assistance Commission has designated August 16th, which is coming up, as Help America Vote Day. Um, so it's National Poll Worker Recruitment Day, and it's it, it's an important tool that we can all use. And so I, I highly recommend it. I'm going to start spreading the word about it now. Yeah, d democracy is a participatory sport, right? We we can't sit on the sidelines and think that democracy is still going to work 
and that uh, democracy is going to win the day. So yeah. it is a heroic thing to do. Please do take the time to check out the website and, and see um, what it is in your state and, and locally you can do to help with the elections that are coming up, either the primaries or the general in November. And also make sure that you check out the breakdown tomorrow night with Tara Setmayer and Rick Wilson. They're returning at 7 p.m. Um, but before we go, we do want to call your attention to a, a Nazi-loving, anti-American tax hiking Arizonan. <laughs> <laughs> Here is, is a look <laughs> at the latest Lincoln Project ad, and we will see you all next week. Good night. What do you call someone always on the wrong side? Someone who has pledged to cut Social Security and Medicare, part of the Republican plan to raise taxes on tens of millions of middle class Americans. Who believes America should have let the Nazis win? Someone who writes lovingly about a Nazi war criminal. That's Blake Masters. And there's one thing Arizona shouldn't call Blake Masters, and that's Senator.